All right, welcome back, everyone. Let's get going on our next topic. Pearl Harbor, of course, one of the, the most significant events in U.S. history, obviously really important for World War II. Um, and we want to talk about, again, the events leading up to Pearl Harbor and how this draws the United States into the war. So, again, this is more of a Western civilization class in the middle, uh, than a U.S. history class, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We've already focused on, you know, the events leading up to the war in Europe, the idea of Hitler, Mussolini, appeasement, of course. Uh, we've talked about some of the battles there, the Battle of France, the Battle of Britain, uh, the story of Dunkirk, Operation Barbarossa. And so as all that's happening, tensions are rising between the United States and Japan, which eventually is going to lead to December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor, which will draw the United States actually first against Japan and then against Germany. Um, we, we actually don't declare war against Germany right away. Even after this, we declared war against Japan. But of course, very shortly after that, we'll be at war with Germany as well. Uh, keep in mind, of course, Japan and Germany have that alliance we talked about before. So what, where does this all come from? Well, here's, of course, our map of the Pacific. And over here on the very edge of this map, you, of course, you're going to see Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands, uh, right over here. And that's where Pearl Harbor is. You can see on our map here Japan and all the imperialistic ambitions of Japan, right? As Japan moves into Asia, into other parts of Asia, into China, into Southeast Asia, they, you know, the entire Pacific, they wanted to take over Australia as well. There was a lot of ambitions that Japan had. And so when you talk about why Pearl Harbor happened, look, at its core is you're dealing with an imperialistic Japan. If you don't have an imperialistic Japan, folks, you never have Pearl Harbor. You never have this event taking place. Um, and so Japan was very aggressive. You know, in, in other lectures, I talk about how Japan, when they moved into China, will do things like hold things like the rape of Nanking. If you're not familiar with that, I believe I covered it in one of my earlier lectures uh, where, you know, they went into China and they're going to massacre countless numbers of civilians there. Uh, for those of you familiar with events during World War II, once the United States gets involved and in how the Japanese treated uh, the American POWs, right, it was horrific. There's a, an amazing book called Unbroken that talks about that, just an incredibly powerful book. And so, you know, Japan at this time period was, was very aggressive, and that's a core element of why it happened. Now, there were other things as well, other than imperialistic Japan, that made Japan do this and attack Pearl Harbor. Um, so let's talk about some of these other things really briefly. Again, some of the stuff we've talked about in previous lectures, and again, if this was more of a U.S. history class, we'd go into more detail on it. But these are things that who had been building up. Why is Japan so upset with the United States? Well, again, other than them being imperialistic, uh, Japan is the open door policy. This is something that Japan didn't like, the United States did like. Uh, again, this idea of opening up markets in China um, and other places in Asia, and Japan wanted to control all those things. They don't want America or the British or anybody else in that area of their quote unquote sphere of influence. So that upset Japan. There were other things I talked about before, too, like the Washington Conference and the Stimson Doctrine. Uh, the Washington Conference, of course, was back in 1921. Uh, when the Washington Conference took place, that upset Japan as well because it, it reinforced the open door policy. It also placed a limit on the number of naval ships uh, Japan can build, so they weren't happy about that. 1931, the Stimson Doctrine, and I'm going through these pretty quickly because they're in my previous lectures, but uh, the Stimson Doctrine, of course, was named after the Secretary of State, Stimson, uh, 1931, who, who put out this idea that the United States would never recognize any land Japan takes over in China as being part of uh, Japanese land. They don't care if Japan takes control of this land and holds on it for a thousand years, the U.S. wouldn't recognize it. So that upset Japan as well. And then the biggie is, of course, in the 1930s, the oil and steel embargo the United States placed on Japan. And oil and steel, obviously, are, are key ingredients you need if you're going to have you know, global domination, or in this case, domination of the Pacific. Without oil and without steel, you can't do that much. And so all of these things combined is going to eventually lead to the decision Japan made to attack Pearl Harbor December 7th, 1941. 
Now, I know there's people out there who go, oh, the United States knew about this and they let this happen. And this is all part of a plot to get the U.S. into the war. And, folks, there's very few to none credible historians that would ever acknowledge that as a reality. Is it fair to say that, look, the United States should have been better prepared? We missed details. There was intel that went south. Absolutely, right? There, there's a lot of stuff that were mistakes made that it should have, we should have been better prepared for something like an attack on Pearl Harbor. But was it all this conspiracy theory? No, I just, I definitely don't buy that. And, you know, I don't think any real credible historian would, to be, to be frank. All right, so what happens? Pearl Harbor's attack. Let me show you some images and then talk very briefly about, you know, what this means in terms of the war. So these are just some images I was able to find of just the sheer destruction created by the Pearl Harbor attack. I'm just going to run through a few here very quickly for you. Uh, the mass explosions that you see the morning of December 7th, ships that were sunk. Uh, there was attempt to raise some of the ships, other ships, of course, like the Arizona. I'm going to show you the memorial of that in a moment that were just simply left under the water as, as tombs. Uh, for the for this for the sailors and for the people who were who were killed. Again, just kind of an overview of all the smoke that filled the air the morning of December seventh. And this is the memorial. And I've been here. It's it's an amazing place to go and visit. I know a lot of people go to Hawaii and think, oh, I'm just going to go Hawaii, enjoy the beaches and all of that, and it's wonderful. But if you ever do go to Hawaii, please try to make some time to go to, to see Pearl Harbor. And not just the Arizona, there's the Missouri, there's the Bofin, there's a lot of stuff to see there. You can definitely make a day out of it. Um, and knowing some history of it before you go is pretty cool. You go there, you see it, and it resonates with you. You know, you know you're literally standing on a gravesite. It's very emotional. And then you go inside the memorial and you see. Um, first of all, from the outside of the memorial, I should say you could actually see kind of the length of the entire ship. Um, and so it's hard to see in this image if you look at it from overhead. But here you see this buoy over here. That's, you know, me standing on a memorial taking the picture down towards one end of the ship. So it's all under the water. And then if you go to the other side, it would be about as long. So it's it's the entire ship is underwater. And then of course, um, you still see the oil popping up as well. Uh, from the from the Arizona, you still see that happening. Uh, so that's pretty dramatic to actually still see the oil all these decades and decades later still appearing from the Arizona. It's very haunting. And then inside the memorial, you see the names of all the people that were killed at Pearl Harbor, all engraved here, you know, and, and it just says here the, the men are entombed and their shipmates who gave their lives in action December 7th, 1941 on the USS Arizona. Uh, so it, it's pretty powerful. It's pretty emotional to go and do this and see this. Um, and when I went there, you know, one thing I, I specifically did, this was many years ago, is I, I did some reading up and it turns out that on, like I think it was on Wednesdays, Pearl Harbor survivors would be there and you can go and you meet them. And so as soon as I found that out, I made sure to go to visit Pearl Harbor on a day where I can meet a couple of the survivors and I went and I met them. Uh, not a very great picture of me, but an amazing picture of these two men um, who survived Pearl Harbor. And they sit there and they tell their stories to visitors and uh, they have their biographies and they sign their names on them. Um, honestly, I don't even know how many of they're still doing this today. I'd have to go back and check even if they're still holding these type of events. Because if you think about it again, this is my very first lecture on World War II. The, genera <coughs> excuse me, the generation that went through this war is almost gone. And so, again, if you have a chance to meet a Pearl Harbor survivor, oh, my God, please talk to them, listen to them, what they went through and, and so forth. It's like same thing I say if you have a chance to meet a Holocaust survivor or a World War II vet, uh, their, their stories are so amazing uh, and so important that we hear and listen to. So I always like to just put this picture up there just to, to remember that the, the, these individuals lived it. These are real people who lived through these events. Um, and then, you know, now the United States is in the war. So once the United States gets into the war, of course, we first fight this war against Japan and then we're engaged in the war in Europe. And once we're engaged in the war in Europe, it's still going to be a long haul. Remember in World War One, the United States gets in World War One around April 1917. By November of 1918, the war ends. 
in the case of Pearl Harbor, um, remember Pearl Harbor, December 1941, we've got about four solid years left before World War II ends. Because again, Japan was so entrenched in the Pacific and Germany was so entrenched in Europe, it's gonna take a long time. Now, other than that, once the US gets in the war, I put this thing here, ration books, stories from home. I have another kind of short lecture I've done that I can kind of, um, you can go and watch. It's about my 95 year old neighbor uh, who was just somebody at home, not you know a soldier, obviously. She, she lived through it, uh, Pearl Harbor. She was in high school during Pearl Harbor. Uh, her name's Alice Pereira. And I tell her story and kind of, she talks about ration books and um, what it was like in the United States during the time and how, you know, basically, you know, one of the things, no, no ships, no, no, no cars were being built because everything was put into the war effort and what are ration books and all these stories from home, as I call them. Um, and it's in another one of the playlists I have on World War II. I just call it Unknown Legends of World War II, along with, you know, World War II vets you haven't heard of before, uh, Holocaust survivors, and, and just hearing their stories are so remarkable. So I definitely encourage people to watch this. Um, you know, for those of you in my History 111 class, I'm gonna uh, make sure to send this to you because I do want you to watch it. Now, for anybody else, you can just kind of go to that playlist on Unknown Legends and, and watch it and just listen to, you know, what's it, what was it like for a high school girl to hear about Pearl Harbor and how people reacted. So with that, the United States is in the war. And with the United States into the war, we're going to then shift back to Europe again. So I'm going to do a couple more lectures now about what happens in Europe, other battles and conflicts in Europe. Uh, we'll talk about um, conflicts in other fronts. And then from there, we'll get into D-Day and then we'll shift back and we'll do another lecture about how the war ends in the Pacific and some of the fighting there. So we kind of jump back and forth now uh, in these lectures. But if you're watching them all chronologically, they should all continue to make perfect sense for you. All right, so if you have any questions on that, please let me know. Um, and uh, that's it. All right, hope that's clear. Thank you, everyone.